Thank you for that. Um, I didn't know they were going to read out that whole thing, so now you know um, my whole life story. Um, uh, as was said, I am the national coordinator for an organisation called Publish What You Pay Australia. Um, during my presentation, I quite often say we, but I should note that Publish What You Pay Australia is just me. So we have one staff member in Australia, um, but we are a global network. Um, we have Publish What You Pay, insert country name, in over 40 countries and a global coalition of over 700 organisations. Um, we do a campaign for accountability and transparency in the extractive sector, and extractives we mean mining oil and gas. Um, and by that in Australia, because it takes on different campaign outcomes in different countries, we campaign primarily for two policy interventions. And one of those is the one that was the very long name you just mentioned, which is the Extractives Industry Transparency Initiative, or the EITI for more ease, um, and a piece of legislation called a mandatory disclosure law. Um, and this is currently existing in the EU. It's called the EU Accounting and Transparency Directive, and in Canada, where it's called the ESTIMA Act. Um, the reason we do this, um, well, one of the reasons we do this is, um, as noted in numerous organisations and research and at the community level um, and by the OECD, uh, the extractives industry is the most corrupt sector in the world. Um, and it is also one of the sectors where countries really try to uh, develop their economies and their people. Um, one of the ways the OECD has identified and what we believe in Publish What You Pay Australia is that open data, so fiscal transparency of payments, is one of the ways that citizens can hold their governments and companies operating in their countries to account for the extraction of their finite natural resources. Um, I'm unsure how familiar you are with this, so if I go too fast or uh, say things you don't understand, please just flag it with me. Um, but a very simple way of explaining what both the EITI and mandatory disclosure laws do um, is that they require companies to publish their fiscal uh, information um, to governments on a country level and at a project level. Um, and these payments include things like corporate income tax, royalties and infrastructure payments. Um, the main difference between these two initiatives and why we campaign for two is that the EITI is a voluntary initiative. So countries have to willingly join up to this. Um, and it's also for payments just at the domestic level. So uh, EITI country only publishes payments that are made within that country. The difference between uh, that and a mandatory disclosure law is that um, it's kind of in the name, it's a mandatory uh, system that companies have to participate in. Um, but it's also for payments everywhere that they operate. And this is before um, production as well. It can relate to rent um, on lands, it can relate to mining tenements, um, but it's everywhere in which they are making a payment to a government. So there are 51 countries currently implementing the EITI. Australia is not one of them. And there are 30 countries around the world that have a mandatory disclosure law. And again, Australia is not one of them. Um, project level reporting has also been seen to be the easiest way for communities uh, to hold uh, governments and companies to account on if they are making the payments correctly. Um, and we believe at Publish What You Paid is at this level of disaggregation that you can actually see if your community is benefiting from extraction. So as a country without either of these two initiatives, we have very little uh, fiscal data that's disaggregated um, for extractive companies in Australia. Um, in 2017, the Resource Governance Index, which is developed by an organisation called the Natural Resource Governance Institute, um, released a ranking of different countries and regions on their overall governance of their extractive sector. You can see in Australia, they just looked at Western Australia and just at mining. Um, and overall, Australia for that uh, segment came eighth out of 81 countries. But when it's ranked solely on revenue management, and this includes indices like um, publication of fiscal data, um, things about laws um, on taxation, we dropped to 32nd. And that means that we rank lower than countries we give DFAT funding to to improve their extractive governance. Um, and so without these laws, um, the fiscal data that is available on Australian extractive companies uh, is problematic because it's highly aggregated, um, it's often unavailable to the public and it can be out of date. 
Many multinationals operating in Australia uh, currently report just one figure for all their taxes and all their royalties combined. And so trying to figure out if we're actually getting a good deal from this extraction is extremely difficult. In March this year, I gave evidence at the um, inquiry into Exxon's tax payments. Um, and Exxon was the subject of this inquiry because I don't know if you saw before that in uh, the newspapers that the Tax Justice Network had shown that Australia will become the biggest exporter of uh, natural gas by 2021, overtaking Qatar. But while Qatar will get um, $2 billion uh, for that amount of gas, we would only get $800 million. And that's about our royalty regime and it's about um, deferred tax assets and how much we let companies roll forward. Um, and Exxon's tax reporting in Australia is an example of how companies can publish this really highly aggregated data um, without any kind of um, disaggregation. So Exxon claims that in 2015 and 2016 they paid uh, $1.3 billion in royalties in Australia. And first of all, we don't like when companies put taxes and royalties together into one figure because a royalty is not a tax, it's a really different payment from a tax. But companies also do it because it's much easier to dodge tax than it is to dodge royalties. So you can artificially inflate your overall figure if you combine them together. Um, the other thing that Exxon does is combine taxes in there that we don't consider taxes that we would like to see them making. So they include things like goods and services tax, payroll tax, employee income tax. And we're not saying they shouldn't be paying those taxes, but by paying those taxes doesn't give you the right to not pay corporate income tax in Australia. You don't get to pick and choose which tax you pay. Um, and the, uh, the other way is that we can't see which projects these payments are coming from or which projects they're involved in. So this is our payment information from Glencore, who you have probably heard of, and if you uh, haven't, have a good Google of their uh, corporate history of operations. Um, they are a multinational uh, company. They are the biggest commodity trader in the world. Um, and they also publish an aggregated figure um, in their Australian reporting of $2 billion. Um, however, Glencore is listed in the UK and the UK has mandatory disclosure laws. So they must publish disaggregated fiscal data for their operations in Australia. Um, these are all the projects that they claim. Uh, companies are allowed to aggregate mines together um, and so you can see that they claim uh, 10 projects in Australia. We think that's about 200 separate mine sites um, and all of these are in production and have been in production for a number of years. And you can see that in 2015 under the UK laws they're reporting um, large amounts of negative tax figures. In 2016 and 2017, they just go to reporting a zero, which they're actually not allowed to do under the UK laws. Um, but they're only reporting taxes ever being paid on one project, and that's New South Wales um, Thermal Coal. So the difference between having mandatory disclosure and not is that with Exxon, when we're giving evidence to Parliament, I can't provide this level of information about where they are or aren't paying tax. And that becomes an issue with the company because they can just claim they're doing something that I don't have access to. With Glencore, we can show that while they claim to pay 1.3 billion in Australia, if you go through their UK payments reporting, it's actually about 800 million. So what the rest of that figure is, is again, probably things like employee income tax, taxes to local councils. And again, they're important taxes, but they're not about the economic contribution from the extraction of our natural resources. So the disaggregation is a hu huge reason we campaign for that. Um, but the other reason is about uh, knowing where exactly we are. So Australia has an, a long history in extractives, uh, particularly the mining sector, um, both here, but we are um, hugely present overseas. So um, we have no government or industry figures that sh are public that show us the scale of where we are present around the world um, or the locations of the projects of Australian companies. Um, and it's difficult to talk to the government about why we need this level of transparency if we don't even know where these companies are. Um, so given that, um, in 2017, we released a report called Abundant Resources, Absent Data. And this was the first by civil society to identify all ASX listed companies that would be captured if we introduced a mandatory disclosure law. Um, I should also say, like, I am, 
I think I would describe myself as a campaigner or an advocate. So the data work you're about to see is a little more rudimentary than perhaps you would have seen earlier today. Um, and I collected all this data by actually going through annual reports because it's the only way to get this information in Australia. We also don't have any requirements for ASX companies to publish in an open format, so they were quite often locked PDF. Um, but what we found was 717 ASX companies in 106 countries around the world. So that's over half the world has an ASX listed company uh, mining or exploring within their borders. Um, the highest regional concentration uh, is Africa, um, continental Africa, sorry, I should say. Our research found 139 companies with 312 projects in 34 African nations, which equates to almost one in five ASX listed extractive companies being present on over 60% of the continent. Um, we don't have similar figures from Australia, but from our research, we could compare um, to uh, figures released by the Centre for Exploration Targeting, which is based at the University of WA. Um, and comparing our figures to what they had, it showed that Australia was actually the number one country present on the African continent and we outnumber co uh, companies from Canada and the United Kingdom. Um, so um, information disclosures through mandatory uh, reporting is powerful, but we also think for the information uh, to have meaning to uh, communities, the impact of disclosure has to be identified. In Australia, we've been primarily using the UK and Canadian laws uh, for investigation into tax payments. However, the data has a multiple amount of uses um, and ActionAid Australia have released a report from the data set that I made, which is available online on the fossil fuel projects in Africa. And so looking at the climate impact that Australian companies are actually have in developing countries. Um, sorry. And so, the important thing um, about mandatory disclosure information is not necessarily how civil society is choosing to use it, because that will depend on the country and the community, but that they have the information available in the first place. Um, we also use this research to advocate to the Australian government and the Australian Labor Party. And last year, in October, we were very pleased that the ALP has announced a mandatory disclosure law. They were elected in 2019. Um, it's the first time a major Australian party has announced this kind of legislation. Um, it differs from the EU and Canadian laws in that it's slightly smaller in scope. Uh, this is a report that I've done with ActionAid that I'm launching today, and both these reports are on the side, so please take a copy, um, where we're looking at what this smaller scope would actually mean in Australia. Um, the, uh, the work shows that there are now 802 companies listed on the AXX, ASX involved in commercial extraction. Um, and 67 of those companies would now be required to report if Australia had a mandatory disclosure law. Um, uh, and six of those 67 already report under other companies' laws, other countries' laws, but 61 uh, companies would be making new disclosures. It would be in 43 uh, different countries, um, and 18 of those countries are currently not EITI or mandatory disclosure uh, countries. So this is new level of transparency and disaggregation that we would be able to see. Um, the country most impacted though would be Australia. Um, so it would be huge for us. Um, the other thing the law would cover would be private companies. Um, and so this would mean um, companies that are operating in Australia that are private multinationals would also have to report to this. But it also means that if they're ASX listed but not Australian incorporated, they would be required to report as well. And this is really important, particularly um, for Southern Africa, which contains really huge companies like Anglo Gold Ashanti and Zimplatz, who are currently not reporting to this level of disaggregation. But again, regionally, where we would have the most impact would be continental Africa. Um, and this is because where we're most heavily present. Um, it would have uh, 17 of the 43 countries um, are located on the continent and 31 of the 67 co uh, companies have a project there. Um, so this encompasses, we think, um, about 50 separate projects um, across the continent um, that range from exploration to um, producing. Um, and many of which cover multiple mine sites and also multiple countries, um, but accounted by the company as one project. Um, following on from this report, we are releasing case studies in um, selected countries here, where we'll be looking at the gendered impacts of what we think this kind of level of transparency will have at the community level. 
Um, and we also hope that this research is going to help embed this policy within the ALP, but also be a knowledge tool um, for other government, particularly um, members of parliament that are in resource-rich um, electorates. Um, you may be aware that the mining industry in Australia has quite an overt and outsized influence on our politics. We're trying to show that, like, we're not taking a position on coal, um, though you can. Um, we're not taking a position on where you are. We're just asking for you to publish your payments. We're just trying to get the transparency to know so that Australian citizens can know and citizens where we operate can know, is this worth it? Are we actually getting what we should be getting? And where is this money going? Um, so I hope that gives you a good understanding of why we're pushing for this data to be open in this sector. Um, as I said, there are copies available there, please take one, but it's also all available online, as is the data sets which um, lists all these companies and their locations. And thank you very much. One question. You know, I think people in this room are much more experienced in data than I am. You know, I think I would say I'm a community user of data, and that's really important. Um, when I started in this row, I didn't have a lot of experience. Um, and so I was quite scared of data and what that meant, even what the word meant and how I was supposed to use it. Um, so it would be really great to see people engaging with grassroots organisations and community organisations and uh, I guess asking them what their problems are and how can they help fix it. All these visualisations I made myself on picture chart, um, but they're not the best, um, you know, and that's not my job. My job is to campaign and my job is to understand this information and take it out to the community. So where we can partner together to make this information more readily understandable by the people that possibly aren't going to engage with this on an everyday basis, I think that's, that's a really powerful part. <laughs>